Good day and welcome to the Foley and Lardner Environmental Law Update web conference. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I would like to turn the conference over to Ms. Jennifer Bartz. Please go ahead, ma'am. Welcome. I'm Jennifer Bartz with Foley and Lardner, and I'm pleased to welcome you to today's web conference. In this program, we address significant Clean Air Act developments, what you need to know. Before I turn the presentation over to Dick Stoll to start things off, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. Today's program will last approximately one hour. The PowerPoint presentation will be available on our website at foley.com by early next week, or simply download it from the files box along the right side of your screen to get a copy of the slides today. If you experience problems with Adobe Connect, please contact 866-493-2825 for technology assistance. For audio assistance, dial star then zero on your telephone to reach an operator. Today's program has been set up in both a discussion and interactive question and answer format. We encourage you to submit written questions during the program. Type your question into the Q&A box at the right side of the presentation slides. And we will respond to questions and also that were written in the Q&A box and also take live questions at the end of the program, time permitting. To ensure you get the most out of today's presentation, we encourage all participants to maximize the PowerPoint to full screen usage. You can do so by clicking the full screen button located above the slides. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will be available on Foley's website by early next week. And Foley will apply for CLE credit after the web conference. If you did not supply your CLE information upon registration, please send an email to jenniferbartz at jbartz at foley.com. Please note, those seeking Kansas, New York, or New Jersey CLE credit are required to complete the attorney affirmation form. A four-digit code will be announced during the presentation. Use the code to complete the form, which can be obtained in the files box, or by sending an email to jenniferbartz at jbartz at Foley.com. At this time, I'm pleased to turn the presentation over to Dick Stoll. Okay, thanks, Jen. Uh, if you read our notice, you know that we have a um, heck of a lot of new developments in the last two or three months under the Clean Air Act. Uh, we've got two Supreme Court opinions in the last couple of months, uh, three D.C. Circuit opinions that we're going to talk about. Actually, <laughs> there are a couple more D.C. Circuit opinions that we're not going to talk about. Uh, a major new proposed rule <clears throat> and uh, some new petition activity by a national environmental group that I think anybody who follows the Clean Air Act is going to find pretty interesting. Uh, we are going to divide up things today. As soon as I can click the right thing here. There we go. Uh, Mark Temke, partner here in the uh, Milwaukee office. And by the way, I'm, I'm in the DC office and the Milwaukee office. I'm in Milwaukee today. Uh, but anyway, uh, Mark and I are going to be talking about a lot of different things. Unfortunately, for those of you who have uh, come to our web conferences or visited our web conferences the last couple of years, you uh, probably know Brian Potts, um, a younger partner out of our Madison office, who's quite an expert on Clean Air Act too. Uh, unfortunately, he took ill this morning and is just not feeling up to doing this. So Mark and I learned about two hours ago that we're going to cover the stuff that Brian was going to cover, which was actually <laughs> quite a bit. Um, but Mark and I follow this stuff, so uh, I think we can we can substitute almost as well as Brian. I would encourage you, by the way, Brian's been writing an awful lot of stuff lately on Clean Air Act, uh, Wall Street Journal and other publications. I would encourage you to go to foldy.com to Brian's bio, um, and go to, uh, I think it's, I can't remember which, one of those words over there on the left that gets you to his articles. Um, and, uh, and he's got several recent articles on some of the things we're talking about today. So you can get a lot more detail uh, if you go to some of Brian's articles that you can get from his bio on the Foley.com website. We're going to divide this up today uh, according to some stuff in greenhouse gas, then some new stuff on maximum achievable control technology, MACT, and uh, some additional developments that are quite important under the Clean Air Act. And uh, so for the first greenhouse gas, uh, now this, these are Brian's slides for a while. Uh, but Mark is going to substitute for Brian on this and, and talk about the major new uh, proposed greenhouse gas rules for existing power plants uh, that appeared in the Federal Register of June 18th of this year. Okay, Mark. All right, thanks, Dick. And yes, this is Brian's uh, material, and I'll try and uh, uh, 
present this, uh, probably not the same way Brian would present it. And uh, as with any of these new programs that are just out, there's certainly uh, a lot that's out in the blog. And encourage you to take a look at what Brian has written, as Dick did. In addition, uh, I think every lawyer has a different particular view on, on uh, a number of the provisions here. But what we want to do is give you a basic of what has been proposed, what are some of the touch points on this, where are some of the issues that are going to be playing out over the next couple of years. I would note that with all the ink that's come out and all the electronic media on this particular provision, it still is a proposed rule. It is not a final rule. It, uh, even though there are some initial early attempts at early litigation, it is still proposed. EPA is still taking comments. This rule could change or could not go forward, or it could uh, be significantly modified depending upon the comments. Now, latters too are probably unlikely, but uh, there certainly could be changes to some parts of this as EPA addresses comments, looks at this further, has further discussions. But let's get into some of the uh, uh, sort of the format of this particular rule. It, it is an interesting um, development by the agency in trying to take a provision of the Clean Air Act, much like what happened with the PSD provisions for greenhouse gas, and try and meld it into a, a greenhouse gas provision. A particular provision is one that has not been used very much in the Clean Air Act, 111D, uh, and that's up on the screen here. And uh, it basically talks about states submitting plans for particular types of sources which are not regulated under 112, which is the hazardous air standard. And we've got about five of those out there right now. One, uh, for example, deals with the uh, craft pulping process uh, for pulp mills. Um, a couple of others are out there. Uh, they're obviously kind of below the radar screen type provisions unless you were in that particular industry. Um, one of the uh, prerequisites that Brian uh, correctly notes is there needs to be a new source performance standard in place in order for an existing source performance standard to be developed. And of course, that we'll see is one of the more controversial items is whether or not EPA's proposed new source performance rule for um, new power plant activities uh, will be challenged and upheld, which is obviously a prerequisite to keeping the uh, existing source rule in place. Mark, one thing to note there, correct me if I'm wrong, but hasn't EPA now basically said that even though they proposed the new source performance standard for power plants a long time ago for GHG, and then they reproposed a few months ago, that they do intend to go final on the same day with, yes. with the existing and new and modified? Right, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. From a timing standpoint, that's right. Yeah. Um, uh, from a uh, from a compliance standpoint with the states, and again, this particular rule uh, uh, is is a, a provision of the Clean Air Act delegates a lot of the responsibility for the development of the specific requirements down to the states. Unlike a lot of other EPA rules, where EPA is very specific about what the rule requires, and the states kind of mimic it. Here, EPA is to set out a broad program, um, and then the states are supposed to develop their own state-specific plans, uh, more of a federalism approach of the original Clean Air Act. Uh, we're supposed to develop rate-based type limits. Uh, these would be certain types of, of electric-powered units, being coal, natural gas, um, uh, other types of, of electric power units would be included in the coverage, and we may see other types of activities that may get regulated depending upon what the individual states would do. We'll talk about that a little further. The, uh, the way EPA has set this up, they've set it up with a 2013, uh, 2030 date for ultimate uh, reaching the goals that EPA has set in the proposed rule with a ramp down period in the 20 to 29 period where states are supposed to have a rate of progress meeting eventually the 2030 limits that are out there. Mark, another thing I wanted to add right here, if this may be a good point. I know that we have a lot of people on right now who represent electric utilities, and I know we have a lot of people on who don't represent electric utilities who are with other industries. But this, is, this proposal relates only to electric utilities, but <laughs> I will say that there's a great level of concern among all industry right now that, you know, if what's next? In other words, if, if, if this structure of this type of proposal uh, goes forward and gets applied to the electric utilities, uh, then 
it, it won't be long before you know you start seeing cement kilns and petroleum refineries and so oil mills and so forth. Yeah, and another aspect of the, of the proposed rule uh, that may affect other types of industries and as a concern, as we're going to see, is dealing with some of the energy efficiency requirements that may be what we call yep. outside of these particular boundaries yep. of, of, a, of a generating plant and who gets credit, who is subject to compliance, if there is credit given for that. Uh, lots of questions come up in that regard, which are not well defined at this point in time. Uh, the state plans, in order to uh, get the states moving, they're not given a lot of time. Usually, you look at the uh, state plans in the SIP process, states get three years. Um, here, we're looking at potential state plans on a, on a very short time frame, June 30th, 2016. Um, uh, kind of interesting uh, timing there if you kind of look at the uh, election cycle uh, of November 2016. But uh, uh, that we can all say whether or not that had any play in, in selecting of these dates. Um, states can give extensions onto the date if they can show justification for it. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, and Dick has mentioned, this is a program that sets a broad outline. Uh, states have significant flexibility that if this rule goes forward, that's where the rub is going to be and how the states go about setting up the program to meet the rate of progress goals and the eventual 2030 requirements. Uh, states can do cap and trade. Uh, we could have a REGI cap and trade program. Um, there could be facility-specific requirements, system-wide averaging going on. So the state has a large degree of flexibility, but that also leads to a potential controversy with respect to how, how states will address these things. Um, there is some confusion in, in the rule over the treatment of new uh, natural gas facilities, whether the credits for those or not, and how they're accounted for. Um, you will, you know, getting into the details of the rule, um, there is a focus on renewables, energy efficiency, uh, to the extent nuclear can play a role. Um, obviously, um, coal is not part of the uh, solution other than shutting down of coal. Um, there are some issues that are coming up with respect to existing nuclear as people read how the plan was set, how the baseline requirements were set. Uh, some of the confusion is that the baseline is set in prior year, uh, prior to 2014, uh, and the implementation of this, but yet we're supposed to be already in a then accounting for reductions that have occurred from the baseline year going forward. Um, and there are no offsets, as you would see in a traditional cap and trade program, where you could go out outside of the electric sector and get offsets in a true regional cap and trade program. And it's not specific here as to how you deal with out of sector offsets. Um, how did they set the uh, state limits? Um, EPA set out some particular building blocks uh, that uh, they they looked at various areas where they thought states could improve depending upon the energy characteristics uh, of a particular state. Uh, they thought that coal plant efficiency could be improved by 6%. There could be some redispatching of priorities dealing with natural gas units. Um, renewables increasing renewable use depending upon a particular state and where they are in, the re in their uh, renewable portfolio. Um, uh, assuming that nuclear plants that are going forward will actually continue to be built and that uh, existing nuclear capacity will not retire, uh, although in Wisconsin we've seen retirement of nuclear plants. Um, and that there will be an in increase in energy efficiency programs that will continue to uh, reduce electric consumption. And again, there are some questions about that because there already are a lot of energy efficiency programs in place, and a lot of the low-hanging fruit may already have been taken. So where is that additional um, energy efficiency going to occur? Uh, here are some of the assumptions that uh, EPA has put out in the proposed rule, um, basically EPA in these states assumes that uh, they're going to close by 2020 um, all of these coal plants in these particular states and replace them with other forms of energy. Uh, and uh, then it assumes that the renewable portfolio will be 
more stringent in these particular states than the uh, current uh, renewable standards, and that includes Wisconsin. So we're seeing a lot of uh, predictions by EPA as to how this rule may be achieved by states. Uh, it's not that states have to do that, but that they're saying that in order to meet the particular goals that were set out for 2030 and the reductions, this is what EPA says states can do to achieve those things. Uh, some of the questions that have come up, EPA in the proposed rule laid out what they call building blocks that states could look at. Uh, and there are a variety of these building block categories. Again, these are just where EPA is saying states can go to try and get these GHG reductions to meet the plan. Um, there is lots of ink out there about whether or not these building blocks are lawful under under the Clean Air Act, under the scope of 111D. Uh, uh, remember, 111D is not a not a statutory provision that uh, allows broad reach of into all aspects of the economy, and so there are some questions as to whether you can really set up this kind of program with building blocks that really do affect large portions of the energy sector, uh, both on the facility and outside of the facility. Um, increasing coal efficiency that's inside the fence line, that's probably a lawful building block. If you're going to have reductions of GHG, increasing efficiency is one of the ways to do it. And, uh, at a particular facility that probably is one that a building block that uh, could go forward. Um, the redispatch and the prioritization of natural gas units over coal units, um, that's a state utility issue. Um, some questions have been coming up about that as the way it's written in the proposal could be possibly corrected in the uh, final plan. Uh, it is an outside defense line because you're talking about the dispatch of an electric system as opposed to activities at a particular power plant. Um, renewables, nuclear, those are clearly outside the fence line of a particular uh, unit. Um, are you redefining what a source is? There are particular lots of questions about that as to whether or not uh, this particular block could go forward. And then the one that is probably the most ink has been written about is looking at demand side energy efficiency. And uh, is that something which you can really uh, take a look at? Uh, Mark, I think it's worth noting here, <laughs> you talk about a lot of ink. Five days after this proposal was in the Federal Register, the Supreme Court issued its opinion that I know you're going to talk about next. But a lot of people in the industry now are taking uh, uh, great glee at some very strong language in the majority opinion uh, on the on the PSD stuff, because yeah. the, uh, <laughs> the the strong language is is that if, you know EPA starts departing very far from the clear words of the statute, uh, that's a, starting to look like separation of powers problems. So very strong language in Justice Scalia's opinion about that. that people are saying uh, is, is probably going to spill over in, uh, to this particular proposal you're talking about right now. Right, and a lot of ink as to whether or not Justice Kennedy would go forward with this based on some of his opinions. So um, there will continue to be lots of uh, lots of legal articles, blogs, and other other things written. And this uh, particular rule, if it goes forward, is likely to be uh, up before the Supreme Court. So we will have to see how that all turns out. One of the interesting issues is as, as these kinds of rules. Uh, take time to go through the courts, and Dick is certainly uh, can talk more about that in terms of the time it takes to get up to a Supreme Court. Uh, look at the time that it takes to get a, a plan in place, and we may be in a situation we faced in the Boiler Mac rules where suddenly court decisions are disrupting people's plans and how you're going to meet a particular rule, and suddenly the rule is changed, vacated, thrown out, and then what do you do? Start all over? Uh, where you've already spent a lot of time, money, and effort to try and reach uh, an effort to, to deal with the rule as it was written. So it's going to be something that we've got to watch going forward over the next couple of years. I know there's a couple of questions that are coming in. I would suggest that probably best that we will get those to Brian and ask Brian to, to, to get back to you directly. Um, again, it was his presentation, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, Brian has a chance to get back to you and fully answer the questions. Um, Brian put together a, a, a 
material as to what happens if some of these blocks, and I, the blocks one through four overturn, and this would be in terms of particular states, and uh, you can see what happens if um, block four, which is the uh, energy efficiency in Wisconsin, for example, that the block four is 34 percent of the reductions that EPA predicts if that's overturned, uh, and, you're, and you're trying to reach the same goals, uh, where are you going to make up that kind of difference? Uh, some of the uh, major challenges that are coming forward, we talked about some of these already uh, with uh, the comments of the Supreme Court and the PSD opinion. Um, one of the items is uh, uh, there's a, a, an issue on uh, 112 because there is a Mercury Mac for the electric power industry and 111D says you can't regulate if 112 covers it. Um, there's already a lawsuit pending that West Virginia has raised with respect to that. Uh, courts try and construe provisions together, and there is some particular language as to whether or not uh, the 111D provision is saying that the same pollutant is regulated, that you can't do it if the same pollutant is regulated as opposed to the same source. So we're going to see where that all plays out. Uh, Brian has listed a number of other legal issues we're going to see out there um, as to whether or not uh, EPA can, you know, what happens if the states don't do anything? Can EPA come in and then uh, set these kind of best standards if the states don't comply? Um, uh, some issues as to uh, can this be more stringent than existing back determinations that have been made on uh, existing uh, electric power uh, situations where those kind of back decisions, as we'll see in the next talk, have generally been about energy efficiency and, you know, range from reductions in the 2 to 5 percent level. Um, there are some lots of questions on federalism, as, as Dick was mentioning, and the scope of a rule that affects a large segment of the economy as to whether or not the Supreme Court's going to allow that to go forward. Uh, I guess I, at, at this point, uh, uh, this basically covered Brian's presentation on it. I, I, I again see a couple of comments and questions here and appreciate those. We'll get those to Brian and ask him to, to respond to you directly. With that, I'm going to, going to uh, move off of the, uh, the, one of the I items where we're having a lot of speculation and a lot of legal talk about it and uh, a lot of uncertainty as to what may come down the road and move into an area where we have some degree of clarity but even though we have a Supreme Court decision, we have a bit of confusion uh, even after we, the Supreme Court has, has spoken on it. Um, this relates to the uh, new source review and the GHG component and the, leading to the uh, recent decision of the uh, Supreme Court as to whether or not PSD applies with respect to GHG. Um, probably know a lot about the background. I'll just quickly mention that the, the, one of the key items to remember as we look at the Supreme Court opinion is that uh, the Clean Air Act sets a general threshold for new source review at 250 tons per year. Um, EPA had used the tailoring rule. We had a number of web conferences on the tailoring rule to try and raise that to a, a much higher limit, 75, 100,000 tons per year as, as the threshold for permitting uh, so that only the larger GHG emitters would be brought into the scope of new source review permitting. Um, and so at issue before the Supreme Court is whether US, or the EPA could set these higher threshold limits above the 250 ton per year statutory threshold in order to avoid a, quote, absurd result, which tended to be where, what the agency was relying on as the legal basis for that. Uh, interesting to compare how the D.C. Circuit dealt with this versus the Supreme Court. The D.C. Circuit uh, allowed these GHG thresholds to remain in place. And interestingly, the D.C. Circuit didn't get to the merits other than the dissenting Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, they used a procedural issue to say that the challengers of the particular rule didn't have standing. Uh, they didn't have a basis to complain about the rule because the threshold was not decreased. So presumably, they weren't harmed because the threshold actually was increased. Uh, so they were actually given a benefit in the reasoning of the court. So the court said, we don't need to reach the substantive issue here. 
uh, as to whether or not it was lawful to increase the threshold from 250 to 75,000 or 100,000. Um, one might question whether that was kind of a result-oriented decision, uh, but that's what the D.C. Circuit did. Uh, the Supreme Court then took it up, uh, quickly dismissed the standing argument that was raised uh, that the D.C. Circuit went on and then got to the meat of the issue. Uh, we had a very divided court, not uncommon in a number of the decisions we have from the Supreme Court, and there were two parts of the opinion, uh, a 5-4 holding that U.S. EPA cannot tailor a statutory threshold requirement. You can't go in and just say it's an absurd result and therefore I'm going to change what the statute says. I think a lot of people thought that was probably what was going to happen. That's, um, Mark, that's the part of the opinion uh, that I was referring to earlier where a lot of people think that some really strong language there could spill over to that uh, first proposal you were just talking about for existing power plants, GHG. Right, where EPA can't go beyond the confines yep. of what Congress actually directed yep. it to do. Uh, then we got into the issue of, okay, you, you can't tailor the statutory thresholds, but what can you regulate? And, and here there was a 7 to 2 holding, again, much more of a majority, but for particular different reasons. But the 7 2 came together and said that, that if you're already subject to new source review, that means for SO2 or for NOx, you're already over that 250 threshold, uh, then EPA can look at your, uh, your GHG and you can be subject to new source review. Uh, an open issue that the uh, court did not clearly decide is the scope of BACT for GHG. The, you know, we've seen some BACT decisions coming out where uh, the agency or the states have said energy efficiency across the entire facility should be what you look at. Give me an energy efficiency reduction plan or energy efficiency improvement plan and I'll put that in the permit that'll be BACT. Um, but if we're looking at an existing facility under traditional BACT and PSD rules, if I'm modifying it, it's only the modified units to which BACT applies. It's not the entire facility. So are these entire facility energy efficiency requirements being labeled BACT appropriate or not? We don't know that. It's an open issue. It wasn't clearly decided. Um, the threshold for GHG backed, the court gave some intimation that perhaps the 75, 100,000 ton per year threshold that was kind of thrown out there by EPA may have to be relooked at. Uh, that's going to probably be an issue in the DC Circuit uh, relook at this uh, when they take the case back. Um, so it's uncertain whether EPA will need to issue a new rule uh, to establish a new threshold in the confines of the PSD program. Uh, practical implications of, of a ruling like this. Um, most backed, GHG backed eligible sources are going to remain in the program. Um, it's 83 versus uh, 86 percent. So basically 3 percent of the potential sources dropped out. Um, and, and I know there's a comment about if you trigger SO2 that why are you subject to GHG, it's because there's a provision in the existing back rules that say if you're major, there's these other anyway sources or anyway emissions, emissions in which you, uh, that are, are, are beyond the particular, not within the scope of the particular thresholds that are there, but EPA has the ability to look at it and it's part of the existing backed requirements that they can do that, which is why the court allowed this to go forward. Um, there's some, uh, uh, in looking at these existing back determinations for anyway sources, you know, the ones that you already have are, are going to remain in effect. Uh, those are permitting decisions uh, unless you want to go in and try and reopen an existing back determination that was already accepted which may tend to be difficult because you may have uh, passed by the administrative provisions to allow you to reopen and challenge that, uh, those are still in effect. Um, so if you have an energy efficient BACT that does, re does de deal with the entire facility, uh, you're still going to have to meet that requirement unless you're able to go in and, and redo the BACT and 
get a new back requirement, which again, uh, state may or may not be willing to reopen that. Uh, future permitting, uh, then if you're going forward, you may be able to scale back the scope of the GHG back requirements, again, by arguing that only the modified unit should be subject to back and not the entire facility. Uh, also recognize that while the Supreme Court has spoken with respect to EPA's rule, a number of states have adopted their own rules with respect to GHG back permitting. And there are state SIPs out there which are essentially state rules. And until those state rules are changed or a state position taken with respect to that, the state is free to go ahead and implement its own state program unless there's particular state statutes which prevent it from doing something different from what the feds would do. So you've got to look at it both at what happened at the federal level and what happened at the, uh, what, what is happening at the state level and with respect to the particular state codes and rules that you're involved with. Dick, I'm going to turn it over to you to okay. deal with MACT and, and, okay. and those kind of developments. Okay, so the first part of this is, uh, again, Brian stuff, uh, the utility mats background, and we're going to get the White Stallion and a new D.C. Circuit opinion. Uh, I want to do a segue between the Supreme Court case that Mark was just talking about on PSD and this so-called mats case or the White Stallion case that we're going to talk about, which upheld the utility mats for uh, uh, under Section 112. The segue is Judge Kavanaugh. Uh, as I think Mark mentioned, Judge Kavanaugh dissented in the PSD case that the Supreme Court finally, um, uh, you know, reversed the D.C. Circuit on. And the Supreme Court's majority opinion on that issue of tailoring uh, quoted from Judge Kavanaugh and adopted Judge Kavanaugh's reasoning fairly strongly there. Um, and I'm going to mention in a minute when we get to White Stallion that Judge Kavanaugh dissented very strongly in that one, too. <laughs> and that one might be going to the Supreme Court. So provide a little segue there. But anyway, we did get the uh, 2012 utility rule under Section 112 for electric utilities for the maximum achievable control technology. Um, now, the, the existing source GHG rule that Mark talked about, EPA estimates at about $8 billion a year. This one, EPA estimates at $9.6 billion a year. So these are both really big rules. Now, the, so the, this was a final rule issued in 2012. Uh, EPA gave sources three years to comply, plus an extra year using a cert provision under 112. There's the uh, applicability there in the slide that Brian did. Uh, but, but let's get on to the uh, White Stallion case. So uh, the utilities and other amici and also the environmentalists all challenged in a really big way this final match rule in the D.C. Circuit. Uh, and just on April 15th of this year, the D.C. Circuit issued its opinion uh, basically upholding the rule in, in all aspects. Now, it was a two-to-one opinion, and again, Judge Kavanaugh had a strong dissent on one issue. Uh, and I should mention that the deadline for going to the Supreme Court is this coming Monday. Uh, I just happened to, I was going back and looking at an inside EPA report of this case, <laughs> going back to the day the, uh, the day after the case came out, Inside EPA says this will almost certainly be appealed to the Supreme Court. Uh, I don't know whether they're right, but I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, again, it's a $9 billion plus $9 billion a year uh, rule, and there is a strong dissent from Judge Kavanaugh. So like looking at the slide here, what the two judges said was that when EPA had to decide whether regulating electric utilities under Section 112 was, quote, appropriate and necessary, EPA did not consider costs, and they didn't have to. Um, now, those of you who are regulated under MACT, uh, what you probably need to know here is the utilities had a special little gift in the Clean Air Act on MACT under 112, where for the electric utilities, EPA can't even regulate utilities under 112 unless they first make a special finding going through a process that the regulation is actually appropriate and necessary. So, and this has bounced back and forth between different administrations, Republican and Democrats, and it's been a long road. But we finally got to the point where the Obama administration did say, yes, it's appropriate and necessary. They didn't base that on costs, they based it on health effects. And 
two of the judges in the D.C. Circuit said that's just fine, but Judge Kavanaugh came down really hard on that issue. And he's basically saying that he just cannot imagine how any federal agency can determine whether something's appropriate without considering the costs. I mean, that's basically what he's saying. And um, the majority disagreed with that. But again, uh, just as the Supreme Court reversed the other day, agreeing with a Judge Kavanaugh dissent on the PSD uh, tailoring rule, uh, we'll see if people go to the Supreme Court this coming Monday and start that process. Uh, it'll be an interesting uh, case to see. It'll be interesting to see what, what the Supreme Court does uh, on this one, uh, and particularly when you consider the makeup of this Supreme Court. Now, even though, let me go on to the next slide. The, uh, as Brian said here, the decision was not a huge surprise. Um, uh, and and he, he does mention that utilities have been planning to comply anyway. Um, and he also has some, some uh, data down there showing how much uh, coal-fired capacity may be shut down because of this rule if it's not reversed by the Supreme Court. Uh, it's, it's worth noting just a couple of things because I'm going to get into this in the next case I'm going to talk about too. The environmentalists didn't like this rule in certain respects, uh, and they ra raised a couple of challenges, but they lost. So the, at least the D.C. Circuit rejected a couple of environmentalist challenges. One of them had to do with averaging. Uh, the rule had said that if you have existing sources with contiguous units, like so, so you've got a facility and you've got two or three units and they're contiguous, you can actually average the emissions to achieve compliance. The environmentalists didn't like that. Uh, but the, you know, the D.C. Circuit said that's okay. Also, on monitoring, uh, you know, the, the environmentalists are always going for continuous emissions monitoring everywhere, CEMS. Uh, EPA gave a couple of breaks for a couple of situations in which sources did not have to do continuous emissions monitoring, uh, and the court rejected the environmentalist claims that that was illegal and went with EPA on that. So at least, at least for industry, there were a couple of good parts to that decision. Okay, now here's another one I want to talk about where there was several good things for industry in a D.C. Circuit opinion, but then one thing that a lot of people think is not so good and it has industry-wide implications. Uh, this is the uh, Portland cement revisit that the Supreme Court did, I'm sorry, that the D.C. Circuit did in April of this year. Uh, the, the Portland cement standards have been in the D.C. Circuit two or three times. This is Section 112 NESHAP or MACT. Uh, there was a final rule that EPA issued in December 2010 and set a December 2013 compliance date. That's pretty standard, three years after issuance. Uh, the industry took that rule to court and, and the D.C. Circuit and won. Uh, there was a complicated issue about EPA's database for setting the 112 NESHAP, had some sources in it, that were cement kilns that would be regulated under Section 129 CISWI standards. And the D.C. Circuit says, hey, those are mutually exclusive. You can't base NESHAP standards with CISWI sources in your database. So they threw that back to EPA. Well, when they threw it back to EPA, EPA did some revisiting of some of the things at the standards, and they issued a new final rule in February 2013. Uh, they, they revised the particulate matter standard uh, in what was alleged to be making it less stringent. Uh, the court sort of assumed it was less stringent. I think people in the industry don't necessarily agree it was less stringent, it's just different. But um, the EPA did not change the other standards like for mercury, HCL, and hydrocarbons. But they did extend the compliance date. This, 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 is, this is, gets significant here. They, they extended the compliance date for all of the pollutants to September 2015. And this is also gonna get significant they included an affirmative defense provision for malfunctions. Now, those of you who are regulated under 112 in all the various industries, a lot of rules that EPA has been issuing in the last two or three years, and it's not just 112, by the way, it's also new source performance standards under 111, and also even CISWI standards under 129. EPA has been including uh, a provision for malfunctions that, that is called the affirmative defense. Okay, uh, the uh, NRDC challenged the new rule in the D.C. Circuit, and they raised several issues, and they lost all of them, and, and the industry is happy about that, except for this affirmative defense, which I'll get to in a couple of minutes. Okay, so here's, now this is a three to nothing decision, uh, and here's what the D.C. Circuit rejected. 
and this was good for the cement industry, but I think for other industries too who are regulated under 112, these are issues that NRDC and Sierra Club have been pushing in other contexts for other industries, not only under 112, but also under 129. So first of all, as I said, the court sort of assumed and agreed with the petitioners that the PM standard became less stringent. Well, uh, and then the petitioners argued that under 112D7, and if you read it, you, you can see that there's a slight argument there <laughs> that once EPA issues a max standard or under 112, it can't revise it in the future to make it less stringent for any reason. Uh, the court rejected that. Uh, they also, the, the, the environmentalists made a big deal about EPA extending the compliance date. They said the EPA could not extend the compliance date for anything and particularly not for the other pollutants where they didn't even change the standard and the court rejected that. And, and you'll see the language there I put on the slide. The, the, the court said it'd be irrational, absurd to have different compliance dates for different pollutants. So again, I think that's for all industry, that's, that's good news. Uh, also for all industry, some good news. And this is an argument that the environmentalists have been trying to win on in two or three cases now in the DC circuit. When the question is whether you go beyond the floor, uh, and if, if you're in the MAC world, you know what I'm talking about. If you're going beyond the floor, uh, do you, uh, can EPA consider cost effectiveness? The environmentalist argument has been that they consider cost, mainly, mainly meaning are you gonna bankrupt the industry, but you can't consider cost effectiveness of controls and the DC circuit rejected that. So that's good news for industry. Uh, now, but on the affirmative defense, uh, the point I'm making here is three to nothing, and you, you can read the opinion yourself, very strong language. And I think the court viewed this as sort of being judiciary versus executive, or judiciary versus administrative. The court basically said when it comes to determining penalties under the Clean Air Act, it is clear that Congress vested the authority of, in the courts to determine what penalties are and not to, not to somehow EPA cannot rein that in in a, in a regulation by providing a bunch of factors that you can get out of penalties. So uh, that was three to nothing. Now, uh, I, I say here that nobody went on a petition for rehearing in that uh, opinion, so now the time is run. Nobody's gone for certiorari. So... Uh, what we had the other day, uh, which is June 17th, I guess, is the Sierra Club has now filed a petition, a rulemaking petition with EPA. And in their, rule petition, in their rulemaking petition, they name every rule in about the last three years under Clean Air Act 111, 112, and 129, where EPA has included the affirmative defense. And they're saying, hey, based on this new decision, it's got to go. And what they say is that there was nothing in the court's decision that ruled that the affirmative defense regulation was illegal that pertained to cement kilns or that particular rule. It was based on the pure logic and the pure language in the statute uh, that basically gives courts the, the sole discretion to determine penalty amounts when you're in court. So um, they filed the petition and they also filed a, a DC circuit petition for review as sort of a protective matter. Uh, on the same day. Uh, now, here's just, I'm gonna go through these real quickly. I mean, you probably know it if you are regulated in the last two or three years, but just look at the types of standards. I mean, some really major, big deal standards. Some of the standards we've been talking about today, in fact, uh, are all now subject to this petition for rulemaking uh, and, and, and the DC circuit uh, uh, challenge that the uh, Sierra Club has raised. And I should also note that in a new EPA proposal, this was just the other day, it's in the June 30th Federal Register for petroleum refining, EPA has gone ahead and basically assumed that they're going to take these affirmative defense provisions out of the rules because they didn't even include the affirmative defense for malfunction in that rule. And they said they couldn't because of this new opinion. And they just said that they can rely on enforcement discretion for malfunctions. Um, now, I, sh I should say that what I'm hearing now uh, is that a lot of industry interests, a lot of trade associations, are probably going to be intervening in the D.C. circuit uh, as a protective matter to try to stave off any sort of like just automatic, automatic repeal of all these provisions in one fell swoop. Because I think a lot of industry people feel 
that malfunctions are something that EPA has to deal with now in their rules, that they can't just say we're going to use enforcement discretion, that, that, that there's case law that sort of supports this, that the, when EPA sets a MAC standard under 112 or 129, it somehow has to give some consideration of malfunctions. And if they can't, if they can't provide an affirmative defense, perhaps like work practices, uh, work practices could be imposed. And so I think there's going to be industry groups intervening soon in this D.C. Circuit litigation uh, in order to try to get a seat at the table uh, to deal with EPA on this, um, on, on this issue of affirmative defense and malfunctions. Uh, now, Brian was going to talk about <laughs> the, uh, the EME Homer decision in the Supreme Court uh, and getting back, this is the cross-state air pollution rule. So, um, and, this, and the Supreme Court did uphold uh, the, the, uh, the so-called transport rule or the Casper rule. So I'm going to cover his slides a little bit and just talk about a little bit what's going on in the D.C. Circuit. I think one bottom line for you, for you people to realize on this now, if you're following the cross-state rule at all, if you're following Casper, the transport rule, whatever you want to call it, you'll remember that the, you know, just recently, I guess it was April 29th, the Supreme Court reversed the D.C. Circuit and essentially said that EPA could go forward with this on two major issues uh, with, with, with the way that they had crafted the Casper rule. Uh, and if you think now that that's all over, it's not. Uh, it's going back to the D.C. Circuit, and things are getting things are getting interesting in the D.C. Circuit there, and there's some motions pending I'm going to talk about. So it's very unclear what's going to happen next with this rule. Uh, okay, so uh, going through Brian's slides here a little bit, uh, if, if you're subject to it, you probably know this already, you know, the three programs, the, the original compliance dates, um, and, and then you realize that, if you follow this, that the D.C. Circuit stayed the CASPA rule in December of 2011, um, because and it was it was a two to one that was two to one right there, uh, but they did stay it. And um, excuse me while I get back to my notes here. And then in August of 2012, the D.C. Circuit vacated the Casper rule uh, two to one, and that left the um, the, the so-called care rule in place. Okay, so then. EPA took this to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court reversed, but on two issues. Okay, I, I should mention I'm, I'm sorry because I'm I wasn't ready to do this this morning, but I am <laughs> I'm doing it. So the two issues uh, that the D.C. Circuit reversed and vacated the cross state rule on are the two issues that went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court disagreed with EPA. But there are several other issues that were briefed in the D.C. Circuit that the D.C. Circuit did not decide that now have to go back to the D.C. Circuit. And some of those are fairly significant issues. So, okay, getting back to the slide here, it was a 6-2 to two decision. Uh, the, the Supreme Court basically rejected the D.C. Circuit's opinion on whether EPA could go ahead and issue federal implementation plans ahead of state implementation plans. Uh, the, the, the Supreme Court agreed with EPA on that and said the so-called fit-first approach, that was fine. And then the Supreme Court also rejected the D.C. Circuit's opinion to the effect that EPA had put too much emphasis on cost-effectiveness in designing its plans, and, and the Supreme Court said that was okay. And, and, and of course, the industry didn't like the way EPA had used cost-effectiveness because the way EPA had used cost-effectiveness in Casper is that they were requiring a lot of places to go ahead and a lot of states to go ahead and impose controls they deem cost-effective, sort of regardless of whether that was really necessary to, to protect attainment and maintenance in downwind states. Uh, but the Supreme Court said basically that's okay, but, and then here's the big but, and this is where, why there's now a controversy that's really starting to brew in the D.C. Circuit, and there's motions and cross motions filed on this. Even though the Supreme Court essentially upheld EPA's approach, on a couple of details they said, hey, it is possible that if EPA's regulations would require upwind states to eliminate more emissions than are necessary to achieve downwind attainment, or to go below the 1% significance threshold, that, 
That is, in other words, over control. That is, if you could, if a state could show that they're actually subject to over control because they're having to do more than necessary to achieve attainment downwind, or they're having to do more than necessary to hit the one percent, you know, to go below one percent, the Supreme Court said that would not be legal. And during the oral argument in the Supreme Court, uh, the Solicitor General of the United States conceded that the D.C. Circuit could hear claims based on that. Well, okay, so now what's happening is uh, there are going to be issues pending in the D.C. Circuit. There have been motions filed recently by the government, and there's going to be a cross motion filed by industry as to what is the scope, what is the scope of the briefing now. Industry people are arguing that now states should have the right, and there are a few states who want to do this, to come in and argue based on this over control principle that the Supreme Court said was illegal. They want to argue before the D.C. Circuit now that they're over controlled. Uh, the government has filed a motion saying no, they can't. Anything, anything that they want to argue now, you can only go back to your old briefs and you can't argue that. <laughs> and so there's going to be some interesting things coming out of the D.C. Circuit on this pretty soon because you're going to have cross motions. And the major issue is whether states can now make arguments as to whether, uh, as applied to their state, there is over control. Uh, so we'll have to see where, that, see where that's going. Also, uh, just on June 26, EPA filed a motion in the D.C. Circuit to go ahead and lift the stay. Now, you remember I told you in December 2011, there was a stay imposed by the D.C. Circuit, and that remains in effect. The government has moved to lift that stay, uh, and industry will oppose that, and the uh, industry opposition is not uh, due, I think, for another two or three weeks. Um, Dick, if I may, oh, yes. I should interrupt you for a CLE yes. announcement. Yes. Right, thank you. Uh, please listen closely for the following CLE announcements. Those seeking CLE credit, please enter the following four-digit code into the CLE credit box that should now be appearing on your screen. The code is U410. U is in uniform, the number four, the number one, and the letter O as in Oscar. Additionally, those seeking Kansas, New Jersey, or New York CLE credit are required to use the same four-digit code to complete the attorney affirmation form. The code is U410. U is in uniform, the number four, the number one, and the letter O as in Oscar. To obtain a copy of the attorney affirmation form, download it from the files box at the right-hand side of your screen or email Jennifer Bartz at jbartz at foley.com. Once again, the code for CLE and the attorney affirmation form for Kansas, New Jersey, and New York CLE is U410. This concludes our CLE announcement. Thank you. Dick, back to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Jen. Just to close off real quickly then with the CASPER rule, the transport rule. Uh, bottom line is, even though EPA won on those two issues in the Supreme Court, it's back in the D.C. Circuit, and the industry and the uh, EPA motions on whether the stay should be lifted and what's the scope of briefing now and whether as-applied challenges state by state can be raised in the D.C. Circuit, that's a very hot issue, so watch for that. I mean, there will be decisions coming out of that probably in the next two or three weeks, I would presume. Uh, now we're ready to go on to some interesting stuff about aggregation in a new D.C. Circuit uh, case, and Mark and I are sort of, we're sort of planning to go back and forth on that a little bit. Yep, all right, Dick, and uh, we're going to move from the, from the macro to a little bit of the micro here and uh, deal with uh, essentially results out of the two uh, circuit court opinions that uh, has some um, effects on uh, a long-standing position on, on a uh, rule dealing with aggregation, which goes into uh, and policy position on aggregation, uh, not a rule, a policy position on aggregation, which uh, affects both Title V permitting as well as new source review permitting. And we want to cover some of the uh, interesting parts of the decisions on this as well as uh, some of the implications which may flow from it. Uh, just a quick background on this. Uh, the whole aggregation question comes up from what facilities should be considered part of a same state stationary source. Uh, and EPA has had a traditional policy memos on there to say that they'll look at contiguous or adjacent properties, same SIC code, and under common control. 
And as you look at the various opinions from, from the 1980s going forward, that the EPA has tended to expand the view of what is a uh, aggregated facility uh, over the years. And where we ended up was uh, being in a situation where the word adjacent uh, tended to mean that there was a functional interrelatedness of facilities, that I would start a production process at one facility, the next facility could be miles away, they could add something to the basic product, and then another facility could finish that product off and all those facilities then would be aggregated and treated as if they were one plant, one facility for air permitting and Title V purposes. Um, so uh, that's traditionally the EPA test that was being employed on this functional interrelatedness of facilities. Uh, there was a, a challenge to this that came up in a, in a case dealing with uh, called Summit Petroleum out of the Sixth Circuit, uh, which deals it's out of Michigan, Ohio, and those areas dealing with uh, 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 facilities in the, in the gas extraction area. And some of the aggregated units were not just miles apart, but were tens of miles apart. And EPA took a, uh, a position that all of those units had to be aggregated and treated as if they were one stationary source for permitting purposes. Uh, that ended up being challenged. It got up to the uh, Sixth Circuit, uh, and that court took a very literal dictionary definition of the word adjacent and said adjacent means adjacent. It doesn't mean functional interrelatedness, and it means that facilities have to be located next to each other to be aggregated, and all of this stuff about uh, you know how a plant or a production process works is nice, but, but we don't agree with it. Uh, EPA then quickly followed with a policy memo in response in December of 2012 that said, okay, that's nice for the Sixth Circuit. I'm glad they like that uh, view, but we're only going to apply the adjacent meaning property next to each other within the Sixth Circuit and all of the rest of the country functional interdependentness applies. So that's where EPA ended up in, in December of 2012, and that's the position that was then subsequently challenged, and, and Dick will cover that in the D.C. Circuit. Yeah, so what, what happens here, and, and actually this slide pretty much just covers what uh, some of what Mark just said, but uh, after EPA issued this memo, and, and again, they did not go through notice and comment rulemaking, okay? They just issued a memo, and the memo, as Mark said, Hayes said, look, aggregation means one thing in a few states, and it means something else in the rest of the states. Okay, a group of industries, NIDACAP, it's National Environmental, I can't remember what it all stands for, but it's, it's, a, uh, it's a group of different trade associations brought suit in the D.C. Circuit uh, and claimed that that memo was, in effect, a rule that should have gone through notice and comment, and it didn't. And the reason it was a rule that should have gone through notice and comment was because it actually, actually revised EPA's regulations that had been in place for a long time. So here's, here's what happened. Uh, what they did is cited some really old air regulations that, frankly, I've forgotten about. I think they were put in place when I was in the general counsel's office in the 70s. There's some old air regulations that, that appear in the general parts of EPA's, you know, Part 56 or whatever, and, the, and they say that EPA's policy is to assure uniform application. You can see it right there on the slide. Uh, of all of its procedures and policies for implementation and enforcement. So, so we can call these the consistency regulations. Okay, so EPA has, you know, regulations that, are, that require consistency among the regions. Uh, and the D.C. Circuit had no problem, three to zero, very strong, quick opinion, very, and they had no problem saying, wait a minute, your regulations say that you will implement and enforce this act consistently across the country. You just issued a memo that says you're not going to do it, <laughs> and you, you just can't do that. I mean, you, you just amended the regulations without notice and comment, uh, and they vacated EPA's memo. So now I guess Mark is going to talk about the implications. Yeah, there's some, some interesting implications uh, with respect to this. Uh, you know, what is EPA going to do in the future with respect to aggregation? And some, uh, some have... Uh, people have commented that, you know, EPA has some, some particular options to look at. 
uh, EPA could go forward with an aggregation rule to essentially, as Dick said, go through a formal notice and comment and adopt functional interrelatedness as the test for the country. Uh, alternatively, uh, one of the other uh, speculations is that EPA could remove this old regional consistency rule. Uh, obviously, a lot of us have always forgotten about that rule actually being there. It was interesting that somebody actually found it uh, and, and, and used it, and EPA may want to remove that rule, and that would uh, remove some of the underpinnings of the D.C. Circuit opinion. And of course, the other, other implication to consider is that states remain free, those who are uh, not delegated states but are authorized states to run the Clean Air Act program to interpret their state SIPs. Uh, they're not subject to a regional consistency rule, and they can interpret it as the state would interpret it. So uh, again, some, some degree of flexibility with the states, whether they want to stay with the existing functional interrelatedness test or fall back uh, to where um, the Sixth Circuit ruled. And so issues are likely to come up more at the state level than at the federal level on some of these questions. Uh, some of the other wider ranging implications to think about uh, uh, the, the, the regional consistency rule talks about criteria, procedures, and policies. First of all, a little bit uncertain as to what all those are. Uh, and those are to be uniform. Um, and some of the questions that exist uh, out there is whether the particular rule that we're looking at uh, or the particular memo that they came out in the Sixth Circuit opinion, um, whether that is a criteria, procedure, or policy, and this is a, therefore a narrow opinion on just that kind of a memo, or since the memo resulted from a court decision, the Sixth Circuit decision, does that mean that it's really the underlying court decision which the region needs to employ uh, that that we have a race to the courthouse as to who gets to have the court decision and all these areas supposed to be required to to meet these requirements. So uh, some of the implications that come out of this that we're going to have to look forward to, uh, we may see the agency trying to get rid of this particular rule, uh, but uh, uh, it's something to watch. And also, if you have aggregation uh, in your permits, you might want to relook at them and think whether or not you want to approach the states and, and try and uh, remove that concept from your permits. I this think is with that, one more example. Yeah, Mark, I should note this is one more example of many of where, depending on who's in the White House, you may have a different view on whether aggregation means, means adjacent or not, because there, there was definitely a switcheroo on this from the Bush administration to the Obama administration on what adjacent means. Uh, absolutely. There was an effort in the Bush administration to try and redefine this. It never yeah. was finalized. And uh, uh, so it was left open. And of course, the Obama administration came in and quickly uh, uh, said they were taking a very different view and took a different position. Well, Jen, I don't think we're going to have time to do any phone uh, questions. Uh, the people who did write us with questions, we will get back to you. All right. Uh, thanks, Dick. And uh, this wraps up our presentation. We invite you to contact any of today's speakers if you do have additional questions or would like more information on this particular topic. Uh, just a reminder, today's program is being recorded and will be on Foley's website in the next few days. If you have questions regarding CLE for this program, you can contact Jennifer Bartz at jbartz at foley.com. And finally, please take a minute or two to give us your feedback about the presentation today using this link here. It's important for us to know your thoughts and help us.